Hello, and welcome to the Idiot Book Nook. We are episode 37. We are doing the Amulet of Samarkand, chapter 21 today. My name is Blazewing, my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I am the Reading Dragon, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm Lady Punnett, and my pronouns are she, her, sometimes they, them. Today is she, her. Excellent. So, as I mentioned, we are doing episode 21 of The Amulet of Samarkand, the first book in the Bartimaeus Trilogy, written by Jonathan Stroud in 2003. We just got done with the with the Parliament, actually, uh, and Nathaniel. We're going to be moving into Bartimaeus's side of the story. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you are more than welcome to do so at l-a-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash idiot book nook. We have our all of our socials. We have links to our website. We should have a link to the YouTube, and we also have uh, feeds for our podcast on five or six different platforms, such as Pocket Cast, Google Cast, um, or sorry, Google Podcasts. We've got uh, Overcast, Anchor. Uh, I believe we're on Spotify, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of different places that we are uh, listed at for this podcast, and we're always looking to expand. So if you have a fa uh, favorite streaming service that we are not on, please hit us up. Leave us a note mm -hmm. and let us know, and we will see about incorporating our podcast feed into there. We want to expand, uh, and we want you to be able to use your favorite streaming service while you're listening to us. If you happen yes. to be watching it to us on YouTube, hello. Um, and if you're watching us this morning on our Twitch feed, which happens live every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, twitch.tv slash blazewing2010, uh, well, I mean, you've been here for a bit because we've already done one episode today. So uh, we're live pretty much every Wednesday. Like I said, episode 21 of the Amulet of Samarkand, uh, episode 30, sorry, chapter 21, episode 37, and narrator. Would you please take it away? Let me get my glasses off real quick. There we go. The Bartimaeus Trilogy, Book One, The Amulet of Samarkand, written by Jonathan Stroud, narrated by the Reading Dragon, voice acted by the Reading Dragon, Blaze Wing 2010, and Lady Punnett. Mm -hmm. Chapter 21. Bartimaeus. The darkness cloaking my mind lifted. Instantly, I was as alert as ever. Crystal sharp in all my perceptions, a coiled spring ready to explode into action. It was time to escape. Except it wasn't. My mind works on several levels at once. I've been known to make pleasant small talk while framing words of a spell and assessing various escape routes at the same time. This sort of thing regularly comes in handy. But right then, I didn't need more than one cognitive level to tell me that escape was wholly out of the question. I was in big trouble. Several conscious levels, that is. By and large, humans can only manage one conscious level, with a couple more or less unconscious ones meddling along underneath. Think of it this way. I could read a book with four different stories typed one on top of the other and take them all in with the same sweep of my eye. The best I can do for you is footnotes. Yes. I feel called out. Oh, <laughs> You're not, you're not the only one. <laughs> like, rude, Bartimaeus. Sorry, but, we can't read four stories at the same time and understand what's going on. Yeah. Unless you're like... That sounds like know. ADHD hell. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. Fuck. But first things first. One thing I could do was look good. The moment I awoke, I realized that my form had slipped while I had been out. My falcon form had deteriorized. My falcon form had deteriorized. 
deteriorated. That's the word I'm trying to read here. My falcon form had deteriorated into a thick, oily vapor that sloshed back and forth in midair, as if pulled by a miniature tide. This substance was, in fact, the nearest I could get to revealing my pure essence while enslaved on Earth. But despite this noble nature, but despite its noble nature, it wasn't wholly fetching. I thus quickly changed myself into the semblance of a slender human female, draped in a simple tunic, before adding a couple of small horns on her scalp, for the heck of it. Footnote 2. Essence, the fundamental essen essential being of a spirit such as myself, wherein my identity and nature are contained in your world. We are forced to incorporate our essence into some sort of physical form. In the other place where we come from, our, sense, our essence intermingles freely and chaotically. Footnote 3. In fact, it had the appearance and odor of dirty washing up water. Ew. Ew. It's quite gross indeed. Hmm. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Go back to your, go back to your uh, monologuing. Yeah. Oh, hush. I am king of fourth wall breaking in this book. Uh-huh. That's why you're the only one that gets footnotes. Exactly. But, unlike a goldfish, I had a good memory. I could remember well, what had well, happened. Well, with this done, you're off track, Bartimaeus. Get back on track. What? With this done, I phrased my surroundings with a jaundice. Oh, Jesus. I accidentally skipped a few pages. What the hell? Shouldn't have been a few pages. Should have only been a couple of paragraphs. Well, because... Yeah, no. Did you lose pages? Are you missing? I get... are you missing? No, I missed paragraphs. Shit. No, because I was following along with the footnotes and then turned the page after the footnote. I'm sorry. Fuck! Okay, there we go. With this done, I appraised my surroundings with a yondest eye. I was standing on top of a small stone plinth, or pillar, which rose about two meters high from the middle of a flagstone floor. On the first plane, my view was clear in all directions, but on the second to seventh, it was blocked by uh, something nasty. A small energy sphere of considerable power. And this was made up of thin, white, crisscrossing lines of force that expanded out from the top of the pillar beside my slender feet and met again over my delicate head. I didn't have to touch the lines to know that if I did so, they would cause me unbearable pain and hurl me back. <sighs> There was no opening, no weak point, no weak spot in my prison. I could not get out. I was stuck inside the sphere like some dumb goldfish in a bowl. But <laughs> unlike a goldfish, I had a good memory. I could remember what had happened after I busted out of Sholto's shop. The silver snare falling on me. The Afrit's red-hot hooves melting the pavement stones. The smell of rosemary and garlic throttling me fast as a murderer's hands until my unconsciousness fled. The outrage of it. Me, Bartimaeus, spark out on a London street. But there was time for anger later. Now... I had to keep calm, look for a chance. Beyond the surface of my sphere was a sizable chamber of some antiquity. It was built of gray stone blocks and roofed with heavy wooden beams. A single window high above one, um, a single window high up on one wall let in a 
shaft of weak and ailing light, which barely managed to push through the swirling motes of dust to reach the floor. The window was fitted with a magical barrier similar to my prison. Elsewhere in the room were several other pillars to the one on which I stood. Most were desolate and empty, but one had a small, bright, and very dense blue sphere balanced upon it. It was hard to be sure, but I thought I could see a contorted something pressed inside. There were no doors in the walls, though that meant little. Temporary portals were common enough in magicians' prisons. Access to the next chamber out, or in, would be impossible except through gateways opened to order by combinations of trusted magician warders. It would be tiresomely difficult to bypass these, even if I could escape my prison sphere. The guards didn't help matters either. There were two sizable Utuku, stolidly marching around the perimeter of the room. One of them had the face and crest of a desert eagle, and cruel curving beak and bristling plumes. The other had a bull's head, blowing clouds of spittle out of his nostrils. Ugh. Both walked like men on massive legs, their great veined hands clasping silver-tipped spheres. Feathered wings lay folded heavily on their muscled backs. Their eyes rolled carelessly back and forth, covering every inch of the room with their stupid, baleful glare. Ugh. A type of djinn much favored by the Assyrian. Assyrian magicians for their unintelligent devotion to violence. I first fought these at the Battle of oh. Al Arish when the Pharaoh drove back the Assyrian army from Egyptian soil. The Utu Utuku 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 look good. Four meters tall, heads of beasts and birds of prey, crystal breastplate, flashing scimitars, but they could all be caught by the old he's behind you trick. Recipe for success. One, take a stone. Two, chuck behind Utuku so that it makes a diverting sound. Three, watch Utuku swirl, eyes popping. Four, run him through the back with gusto. Five, float to taste. Oddly, my exploits that day made me a few enemies among the surviving Utuku. Gee, I wonder why! It wasn't my fault they were attacking me. Much. I have a feeling it was. You don't know that. You weren't there. <laughs> I gave a light, rather maidenly sigh. <sighs> Things really didn't seem too promising. Still, I wasn't beaten yet. Judging by the impressive scale of the prison, I was probably in the hands of the government. But it was best to be sure. The first thing to do was grill my warders for as much information as they had. Which was unlikely to be much. As a rough rule of thrum, you... Th thrum. As thrum. a rough... Rule of thumb, you can gauge a gen's intelligence by the number of guises he or she likes to wear. Bringly entities such as me have no limit to the forms we take. The more the merrier, in fact. It makes our existence slightly less wearisome. Conversely, the, the true dull heads, viz, jabur, utuku, etc., favor only one, and it's usually one that this usually the, one that is millennia. millennia out of date the forms these utaku wore were fashionably and were fashionable in the streets of 
Nineveh. Nivaron back in 7, 700 BC. Nineveh. Who goes a. Hmm? Nineveh. 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 Back in 700 BC. Who goes around as a bull headed spirit nowadays? Exactly. It's so passe. Clashes with everything. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Bull heads are so last season. Last millennia. Ugh. 700 BC called they want their bull head back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Bartimaeus, oh. if you would, please. All right, hold on a second. I just need to clip that bit. There we go. And we're going to pause. There we go. God dang it. I paused it, damn it. There we go. There we go. I gave a slightly insolent whistle. <whistles> the nearest Dutuku, the eagle-headed one, looked across, jerking his spear in my direction. I smiled, winsomely. Hello there. The Dutuku hissed like a serpent. Showing his sharp red bird's tongue, he approached, still fainting, thought, still fain toughly with his with the spear. Mm. Steady with that thing, I said. It's always more impressive to hold a weapon still. You look as if you're trying to skewer a marshmallow with a toasting fork. Eagle Beak came close. His feet were on the ground, two meters below me. But even so, he was easily tall enough to look me in the eye. He was careful not to get too near to the glowing wall of my sphere. Speak out of turn again. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> the Utuku said. And I'll prick you full of holes. He pointed to the tip of his spear. Silver this is. I could pass through your spear easily, uh, easy and prick you good if you don't shut up. <laughs> oh, points already taken. I brushed a loop of hair back from my brow. I can see I'm at your mercy. That's right. The Utuku made to go off, but a lonely thought had somehow made it into the wasteland of his mind. Here. He added. My colleague. He indicated Bullhead who was watching us from a distance with his little red eyes. He says he's seen you somewhere before. Mm, I don't think so. A long time ago, only you looked different. He says he smelled you, certain. Only he can't think when. He may be right. I've been around a fair time. I have had... Um, I have a bad memory for faces, I'm afraid. I can't help him. Where are we now, exactly? I was trying to change the subject here, uncomfortably aware that the conversation might shortly get round to the Battle of Al-Arish. If Bullhead was the survivor, and he learned my name. The Utuku's crest tipped back a little as he considered my question. No harm you're knowing that, he said at last. We're in the Tower. The Tower of London. He spoke this with considerable relish, banging the base of his spear on the flagstones to emphasize each wood. Each word. Sorry. There's no wood. It's stone. There's wood in this prison. Stone pillars. Anyway, oh, that's good, isn't it? Not for you. Several flippant remarks were lining up to be spoken here. 
But I forced them back with difficulty and remained silent. I didn't want to be pricked. The Utuku marched away to resume his patrol. But now I spied Bullhead coming closer, <gasps> snuffling and sniffling, all the while with his vile, wet nose. When he was so close to the edge of my spear that the gouts of froth he breathed out fizzed and foamed against the charged white threads, he let out a tormented growl. I know you, he said. I know your scent. Long ago, yes, but I never forget. I know your name. A friend of a friend, perhaps? I eyed his spear tip nervously. Unlike Eagle Beak, he didn't wave it about at all. No, an enemy. Terrible when you can't remember something that's right on the tip of your tongue, I observed. Isn't it, though? And you try so hard to recall it, but often as not, you can't because some fool's interrupting you, prattling away so you can't concentrate, and... Bullhead gave a bellow of rage. Shut up! I almost had it then! A tremor ran through the room, vibrating along the floor and up the pillar. Instantly, Bullhead spun on his heels and trotted across to take up a sentry position against a nondescript bit of wall. Hmm. A few meters away, Eaglebeak did the same. Between them, an oval seam appeared in the air. It widened at the base, becoming a broad arch. Within the arch was a blackness, and from, it, and from this two figures emerged, slowly gathering color and dimension as they forced their way out of the treacly, non, the treacly nothingness of the portal. Both were human, though their shapes were so different that this was hard to believe. One of them was Sholto. Ugh. <laughs> Fuck. He That's was... not in the book! It is now. <laughs> he was as round as ever, by the way. But hobbling nicely, as if every muscle pained him. <laughs> I was pleased to see, too, that his plas... What was it? Plasm firm. Oh. Pla you mean plasm firing? No, plasm firing, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. I was pleased to see, too, that his plasm firing walking stick had been swapped for a pair of very ordinary crutches. His face looked as though an elephant had just got up from it, and I swear his monocle had sticky tape on its rim. One eye was black and closed. I allowed myself a smile. Despite my predicament, there were still a few things left in life to enjoy. Sholto's bruised immensity made the woman alongside him seem even thinner than she actually was. A stooping heron from a creature, she was dressed in a gray top and a long black skirt, with straight white hair cropped short abruptly behind her ears. Her face was all cheekbones and eyes, and entirely colorless. Even her eyes were washed out. Two dull marbles, the color of rainwater, sitting in her head. Long nailed fingers, like scalpels, jutted from her frilly sleeves. She carried the odor of authority and danger. The Utuku clicked their heels and saluted as she passed, and with a snap of her two sharp nails, 
the portal behind her closed into nothing. Trapped in my sphere, I watched them approach, thin and fat, stooped and limping, all the while behind its monocle, Sholto's good eye was fixed on me. They stopped a few meters off. The woman snapped her fingers again, and, to my slight surprise, the flagstones on which they stood rose slowly into the air. The captive imps, beneath the stones, gave occasional grunts as they shouldered the burden, but otherwise it was a pretty smooth move, hardly any wobbling. Soon the stone stopped rising, and the two magicians stood regarding me at my level. I stared back, impassive. Woken up, have you? The woman said. Her voice was like broken glass in an ice bucket. Good. Then perhaps you can help us. First, your name. I won't waste time calling you Bobman. The records have been checked, and we know that identity is false. The only djinn with that name perished in the Thirty Year War. Unexpectedly sharp. A coal and cold. No one can say I don't work hard describing things for you. I work my ass off for this. <laughs> Appreciate it. I shrugged. I said nothing. We want your name, your profession. No, wait, sorry. We want your name, your purpose in coming to Mr. Pinchop, and everything you know about the amulet of Samarkand. Above all, we want to know the identity of your master. I brushed my hair out of my eye and smoothed it back. My gaze wandered around the room in a bored sort of way. The woman did not become angry or impatient. Her tone remained level. Are you going to be sensible? She said. You can tell us straight away or tell us later on. It is entirely up to you. Mr. Pin, by the way, does not think you will be sensible. That is why he has come. He wishes to see you and see your pain. Does he now? Mm -mm. I gave the battered Sholto a wink. Go on. I prompted him, with rather more cheer than I actually felt. Give me a wink back. It's good exercise for it's good exercise for a bruised eye. The magician bared his teeth, but did not speak. The woman made a motion, and her flagstone slid forward. You are not in a position to be impudent, demon. Let me clarify the situation for you. This is the Tower of London where all the enemies of the government are brought for punishment. Perhaps you have heard of this place. For 150 years, magicians and spirits of all kind have found their way here. None have left it, save at our pleasure. This mm -hmm. chamber is protected by three layers of hex locks. Between each layer are vigilant battalions of Horals and Utaku patrolling constantly. But even to reach them, you would have to leave your spear which is impossible. You are in the Mournful Sphere. It will tear your essence if you touch it. At a word of my command... She uttered a word, and the force lines on the sphere seemed to shudder and... grow. The orb will shrink a little. You can shrink too, I am sure so. To start with, you will be able to avoid being burned and bristled. But the orb can shrink to nothing. And th that you cannot do. I couldn't help glancing across at the neighboring pillar. With its densely packed blue sphere, something had been inside that orb, and its remains were in there still. The orb had shrunk until it had run out of room. It was like glimpsing a dead spider at the bottom of a dark glass bottle. The woman had followed my gaze. Exactly, she said. Need I say more? 
If I do talk, I said, addressing her for the first time, what happens to me then? What's to stop you from squeezing the juice out of me anyway? If you cooperate, we will let you go, she said. We have no interest in killing slaves. Oh, really now? She sounded so brutally forthright, I almost believed her, but not quite. Before I could react, Sholto Pin gave a wheezing cough to draw the woman's attention. He spoke with difficulty, as if his ribs were hurting him. <laughs> I believe Sholto was also Lady Punish. Oh, that's me. The attack. He whispered. The resistance. Ah, yes. The woman turned back to me. You will even... You will gain even more chance of reprie, reprie, reprieve. reprieve if you can give us information about an incident that happened yesterday evening after your capture. Hold on, I said. How long have you kept me knocked out? For a little under 24 hours. We would have interrogated you last night, but as I say, this incident... We didn't get around to removing the silver net until about 30 minutes ago. I'm impressed at the speed of your recovery. Don't mention it. I've had practice. So, this incident... Tell me... What happened? So right. I've been knocked out by various times by various people in places as far... A field. A field as... Persephius, the Kalahari... Persepolis. Persepolis, the Kalahari, and... Cheapscape? Chesapeake. Chesapeake Bay. I was... It was an It was an attack by terrorists styling themselves as the resistance. They claim to loathe all forms of magic, but notwithstanding that we believe they may have some magical connection. Jinn such as yourself, perhaps. Conjured by enemy magicians. It's possible. Ugh, the resistance again. Simpkin had mentioned them, too. He'd guessed they'd stolen the amulet, but Lovelace was responsible for that. Perhaps he was behind this latest outrage as well. What sort of attack was it? An elemental sphere. Futile. Hazardous. Haphazard. Same difference! No... Haphazard is less. <laughs> there was still a hazard to people's health. There was. But the word you're looking for is haphazard. Because it was not a well thought out plan. Anyways. Anyways. Didn't sound quite Lovelace's cup of tea. I saw him as more of a stealth and intrigue man. The kind who authorizes murders while nibbling cucumber sandwiches at garden parties. Also, the, his note to Shyler had suggested they were planning something a little farther ahead. My musings were rudely disrupted by a guttural snarl from my old friend Sholto. Enough of this. I will not tell you... It will not tell you of its own free will. Reduce the orb, dear Jessica, so that it squirms and speaks. We are both far too busy to loiter in this cell all day. I know your name now. <laughs> For the first time, the thin-lipped slash that was the woman's mouth extended outward in a kind of, well, smile. Fuck. Mr. Pin is impatient, demon. She said... He does not care whether you speak or not as long as the orb is put to work. But I always prefer to follow proper procedure. I have told you what we require. Now is the time for you to speak, to talk. 
A pause followed. I'd like to say it was pregnant with suspense. I'd like to say that I was wrestling with my conscience about whether to spell the beans about Nathaniel and my mission. That waves of doubt poured dramatically across mm, that waves of doubt poured dramatically across my delicate features while my captors waited on the tent tenter hooks. Tenter hooks? Yes. Okay. While my captors waited on the tenter hooks to know what my decision would be. I'd like to say that, but it would be such a lie. So it was, in fact, a rather more laden, dreary, and desolate kind of pause, during which I tried to reconcile myself to the pain that I knew would be forthcoming. And I am... Scrupulously. Thank you. Scrupulously honest, as you know. Nothing would have given me greater pleasure than to stitch Nathaniel up good and proper. I'd have given them everything. Name, address, shoe size. I'd even have half hazard. I'd even have ha hazarded. That's the word I'm looking for. Hazarded. I'd even have hazarded a guess about his inside leg measurement if they'd wanted it. I'd have told them about Lovelace and for quarrel, too, and precisely where the amulet of Samarkand was to be found. I'd have sung like a canary. There was so much to tell. But if I did so, I doomed myself. Why? Because, one, there was a good chance they'd just squish me in the orb anyway, and two, even if they did let me go, Nathaniel would be killed or otherwise inconvenienced, and I'd be bound for old Chalky at the bottom. Chalky, right? And I'd be bound for old Chalky at the bottom of the Thames. And just the thought of all that rosemary made my nose run. Thoughtful persons might at this point object that since Lovelace has stolen the amulet and was thus working against the government, it might have been worth a gamble to tell them about his crimes. Perhaps both Nathaniel and I might have been let off for service, services re rendered. True, but unfortunately there was no knowing who else was involved with Lovelace's plot, and since Sholto Penn himself had been lunching with Lovelace the previous day, there was certainly no trusting him. All in all, the risk of coming clean far outweighed the possibility of benefits. Better a quick extinction in the orb than an infinity of misery. So I rubbed my delicate chin and waited for the inevitable to begin. Sholto grunted and looked at the woman. She tapped her watch. Time's up, she said. Well. And then, as if written by the hand of a bad novelist, an incredible thing happened. I was just about to give them a last tirade of impassioned, yet clever abuse, when I felt a familiarly painful sensation in my bowels. A multitude of red-hot pincers were plucking at me, tugging at my ens tugging at my essence. I was being summoned. Oh, I thought he was constipated. <laughs> so that ends uh, chapter twenty-one, constipation notwithstanding. <laughs> and. Um, uh... I am sorry for any sexual panic attacks I may have ensued with my voice acting. You are good. For nothing. So. I apologize for nothing, actually. My points. First of all, Ferret, no, we are not doing Demon Girl bathwater. <laughs> Why not? Uh, for those of you that can't see, that's actually in our chat. So if you look at our, if you come and join us on Twitch or you uh, take a look at our clip, our, our uh, videos on YouTube, you'll be able to see the chat there. Um, and it, it's actually like a live scrolling of our Twitch feed chat uh, to which Ferret at one point suggested Demon Girl Bathwater. Second, I love the attitude that you're putting into Bartimaeus' arrogant monologuing. Just that <laughs> fucking attitude makes my day. Three. Well, he's an attitude-ridden bitch. <laughs> Three. Towards the end. 
Part of me is going all white girl towards the end for a second. <laughs> and four. Did Jonathan Stroud just make a dig at himself? Yes. <laughs> Dude! He made, a, he made a dig at himself with the footnotes comment. Not, I love not it. just that. But if we go back towards the very end, and then, as if written by the hand of a bad novelist, an incredible thing <laughs> happened. Dude, yeah. way to break the fourth wall. I love, I, I love that shit. Keep he broke it up. the fourth wall within with a character who breaks the fourth wall. Oh God! Imagine him. Imagine Bartimaeus, Deadpool, and Harley Quinn having lunch together. Oh fuck! So Jonathan Stroud effectively broke the fourth wall within the fourth wall. Yep, mm -hmm. I love it. He uh, eighth wall broke. Maybe. Working meta, uh, like working uh, in meta space is actually probably one of my favorite things. I mm -hmm. love working meta, so... It's it's hard to do it well, too, without it coming off too preachy, so yes. well done. Yes, absolutely, well done. Just a comment here or there. Jay has redeemed a posture check. <laughs> and uh, that is it for my comments for this chapter. I don't know if either of you have anything. Uh... Joto Pin is not a smart man. Nope. No, he's okay, not. Okay, well, no, I'll rephrase. Last episode, or last chapter we had with Bartimaeus, he proved that he was somewhat cunning. Yep. Because he knew something was up, because he was like, this makes no sense. I was having lunch with Simon Lovelace, and you're saying you were sent by Simon Lovelace. Yep. This time, he said the woman's name. Yep. yep. We know her name, although it's not her real name is Jessica. He's also yeah, however, however, that could still be used. It can still be used. So he essentially doomed her. Yep. Now, he doesn't know... Bartimaeus doesn't know her full name. But still, it's been stated that if you summon a demon, it's not good for them to know your name. Whether or not it's yep. her real name, however, is another thing. That being said, it also has been pointed out that he is being extremely impatient which can also lead to stupid mistakes. Yeah, just He's also uh, probably in pain. Yeah. Probably. So, yeah. It's yeah, it's definitely a thing. Also, finally, we have like badass magician lady. Yes, we do. Yep. Like no offense to all the other ladies we have had in the book thus far who have all been proven to be competent in their own way. But none of them have been shown to be magicians thus far. So nope. it's nice to see, yes, there is magicians who, from what we've seen, she seems to be of someone of high power or high note in the yes. ministry. Because she said, like, you have all of this to contend with within each layer of that security. There is a little army of people. And I can make this sphere shrink further and further until it is nothing at all. Yep. Like, that is impressive. Absolutely. I am assuming that's impressive. Because it sounds impressive. Jay says Smeagol. At least. Smeagol. 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 Hmm. My precious. But, um... Now, although we're probably going to get into it in the next chapter, it will be interesting of... Can Bartimaeus be summoned away? While he is within this sphere, or will he basically be, like, pulled against the wall? So they're setting it up like he's going to be, like, he's going to pop out of this sphere. That's the way Jonathan's setting it up. Because, well, well, especially with his very, like, like, the writings of a bad novelist. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. point that out. With that dig it himself, it's like, just so you know, there's a plot device here. And yes, I know it's a plot device, and yes, I know it's obvious. So let's go with it. Let's just roll yeah. with it. So, Can we just okay. clip that and, like, at uh, Jonathan for that and just be like, congratulations on making a dig at yourself and having the guts to do so? Yeah. Yes. I can't wait to see how this pans out because we've got an inescapable object, which is now being crossed with something that can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And it's been stated, you cannot be ignored if you are being summoned because it causes you great pain. Correct. Yep. It's like an immovable object meets an unstoppable force. Or the impenetrable shield versus the spear that can, in that, that can go through anything. Yes. Yep. So I can't wait to see how this is going to play out.
Like Bartimaeus, right. Bartimaeus might be in some shit here. Oh yeah. No, well not just Bartimaeus, Nathaniel as well, because Nathaniel realized in last episode that he's like, Oh, I fucked up. Yep. He had the oh I fucked up face in the car. Yep. I wonder so you remember in the last chapter, uh, there was mention of a woman in a dress that looked like it had been dumped with water. Yep. I wonder if that was Jessica. Hmm. Interesting. Because think about it. We weren't given a description of many other women. That's true. And the fact that we were given this description of a woman in the group who looked like she had a was wearing a wet paper dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of referring to someone who has the personality of a wet paper bag. Someone who... It could, does... it could be ironic because this could be this woman who is very steadfast, very strong-willed, yeah. being mm -hmm. reduced to wearing something that makes her look weak and impassive. Yeah. And in the beginning of uh, the chapter prior to last chapter um there was only the description going more into detail of the very same woman that we were jessica um in, when she entered the parliament so it would be interesting to see that also jonathan stroud or not jonathan stroud um jolto Mm -hmm. seems to be familiar with her mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. as we know from different medias um usually you call someone by their surname mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you're particularly close with them yep mm -hmm. and a surname would have been safer to call somebody because anyone can have like a smith a stone jonathan jessica though is a given name yep yep mind you it's one that she chose because of the whole naming yep. ceremony thing mm -hmm. but the fact that he felt familiar enough with her to call her by her first name instead mm -hmm. of calling like how uh sholto we know sholto calls him calls lovelace lovelace yep but he's comfortable enough with her to call her jessica which makes me think they know each other on a personal level or possibly although no proof they might have trained together Maybe they had the same master, or maybe their masters were close. Because we've seen that other apprentices are actually socialized with other apprentices. Yeah. Fucking Underwood. Yeah. Well, I mean, we all let's not pretend like Underwood's not a dick. Oh, okay. So. I had a theory of this now, because mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have more context, and I actually want to bring this up. What if the reason Nathaniel isn't socialized is because... Underwood has no one to socialize with him. Yeah, that is a fair point, especially after um, reading through the chapter before last. Yeah, because it was stated how he was tr how Lovelace, uh, not Lovelace, Underwood was trying to make conversation, but people were either igno flat out ignoring him or like tolerating him. We've, yeah, we've, and go ahead. We've discussed in the past, uh, actually, how Underwood apparently has nobody. Like, nobody likes him. Nobody will associate with him nobody will talk to him um which leads to yeah that whole idea that nathaniel may not have anyone to associate with on account of his master yeah like it's even described in the chapter before last during the the meat of the event um that Underwood was pretty much kept on the outskirts of the groups that were in conversation, the social groups yeah. that he was trying to make conversation with. Mm -hmm. And so, Jay is asking in the Discord chat, how many chapters are we doing today? Nah. I think I think I can do at least one more chapter. I would like okay. to do at least one more chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it makes me wonder if maybe Underwood... Now, we all know he's not, like, the very paternal, but I imagine maybe he tried to find people to socialize with him, at the very least to, like, compare apprentices, because you know that's what uppity people do. They're like, oh, your apprentice can do this, my person's already summoning their first knoll, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it makes me wonder if no one was, like, 
oh yeah, sure, we'll we'll book a time. I'm I'm just so busy right now, or they just ignored the invitation altogether. Yep. It also makes me kind of wonder how much of an asshole Underwood actually is, and maybe if that's part of the reason why he only has six people working with him in his department. Yeah. You think it's like a refusal of to work with him? Probably. So. Thoughts for sure. Does anyone else have any notes? Because those are the only ones I could really uh, think of off the top nope. of my head. Not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, mine were just more flippant comments this chapter than anything else. Uh, I had nothing actually of note, so. Oh, uh, Bartime still... is flirting with Sholto yeah. just to get yeah. under his skin, though. Yeah. Mm hmm I was hoping for more flirting. I mean, you only have so much time to do flirting before a sphere starts to close in on you, and then you're summoned by your ten-year-old charge. Not gonna lie. Bartimaeus, if he was a real character, would be my kind of people. I would, I could see myself associating with him hands down. A real character? Don't you mean a real person? Real person. Fuck off. <laughs> uh, I think it would depend on my social battery and how much of Bartimaeus he is being. You know, mm -hmm. I could see him being, I could see him being the kind of person that, yeah, sure, I'll definitely go hang out with you and have drinks with you in the group. Yeah. But depending on how much of my social battery I have, I do not think I could handle you by myself. So with that, I think this is a good place to leave off this chapter. Mm -hmm. Thank Ooh. you for joining us for chapter 21 of the Amulet of Samarkand. And I believe this is episode 38. Yes of the Idiot Book Nook podcast. Once again, if you'd like to reach us on social media, you can do so at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash Idiot Book Nook. We have links to our socials. We have links to our website. We have links to our podcast feeds. And if you'd like your podcast, your favorite podcast streaming platform added, leave us a note. Over on Anchor, you can also leave us voice messages, and we can play those for uh, viewer listener feedback. So if we have any listeners out there who would be interested in uh, having your questions or maybe your comments aired, we are more than happy to do that. And we could leave that for maybe an episode where, say, Lady Punnett or, or maybe the Reading Dragon aren't around. One out of two of us, we could, we could do that for a feedback episode. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this episode it's been intriguing it has been absolutely fascinating but for episode 38 of the idiot book nook my name is blazing i am the reading dragon i'm lady punnett and we'll see you in episode 39 toodaloo <laughs>